Good morning, church family. What a delight to be here together. Thank you. You guys look dashing in khaki and black. Thank you, our Pathfinders, and your safe return. Um, Belinda is always leading from the sidelines, shaking her head at me because she loves it when I call attention to her. Belinda Bader, everybody. <laughs> I am certain of your love for me, and you are certain of my love for you. What a delight to be here together. Thank you so much of all the things that are pulling you away, because sometimes we come to the sanctuary heavy-hearted, but may we leave this place happy and full, because we have been together and we have been with Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you have gotten us here. And all you ask is that we be here. So help us release everything. Speak to us. Continue to speak to us. Continue to bless us as only you can. For we long to be with you. And you are certain to come with us. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have shared this more than once um, in different settings that I have uh, become a, a, like a very dedicated walker. Dedicated is light for somewhat obsessive at times. Like I've gone a little bit to the like hardcore side about walking, which is like the most gentle thing you can be hardcore about. Um, and I do it a lot. I try to do it every day and it's very, very good for my mind, soul, body, and spirit. Amen? You've got to have a thing. And I didn't expect it to be such a simple thing, but it's become pretty, pretty, a pretty important staple in my life. But friends, may I confess to you that I do not always feel like walking. I always walk. I do not always feel like walking. And I have learned that when things are really dire, when, when it really looks bleak, like I will in fact let the couch win, I have an emergency contact that I can be certain of. Perhaps if I turn it on. I felt it, Curtis, I felt you, your spirit. <laughs> Thank you. I have an emergency contact when I do not feel like doing it on my own. Here she is. <laughs> I know. Also, right? Beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Good, good bones. I've got good bones. <laughs> It doesn't matter the time of day, and usually it, lean, it leans into the late evening. My mom and dad live 600 meters one way from me, and if I know that I cannot do it on my own, I will call my mom, and the conversation is never direct, because us Latin folk, we don't do that. We, we you know, this is the thing I wanna say, I'm gonna come at it this way. Hey mom, hola amor. <laughs> What you doing? Oh, nothing. Do you have your steps? Oh, what a segue this is. No, I don't. I'm so tired. I don't want to go. Do you want company? Yes, I'll be right there. <laughs> you got a letter offer, right? And then you take her, you give no opportunity for her to say no. Because in my heart, all I want is for somebody to come with me. But at the end of the day, it has to be a very specific somebody. And this is the invitation that we have. Jesus comes with us. I only, at this point of the day, there's really a short list of people and it's actually just one. I usually just want my mommy at the end of the day. Is it okay for a grown person to say that? Yes, I just want my mommy at the end of the day and so I invite her, well not really, I let her invite herself and then I absolutely take her up on her offer. And it's always a delight, we always go more than we need 
And often we part ways because she's like, I don't need to walk anymore. If you have your steps, I'm going home and you go home. But we've had this opportunity together. My emergency contact when I need to get my steps is my mom. We have a beautiful story. It's kind of bookended amidst a lot of pain that's happening. So this is where we're going to be. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. The theme is Jesus comes with me. And we have this story that is just so, so laden with the presence of Jesus during a particularly difficult time during the early church. This is post his crucifixion. This is just, just days, short days after the hearts of his followers have been broken and they cannot see what is coming. They are just utterly devastated. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 24 and we're going to be starting at verse 13. I love all of the rustling of pages, the swoosh swooshing of you opening your Bibles. Say amen if you have it. Amen. All right, let's read together, and I'm going to interrupt myself liberally, but please plant yourselves in Luke chapter 24. We're going to make our way slowly. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. We find ourselves just picked up into the story because we've missed, we've skipped the first 12, 13 verses. In the first 12, 13 verses, what has just taken place in the book of Luke? Yes, I heard husm tum. Yes, that is exactly the right answer. On the Three days, it's been three days since Jesus has died and been put in the tomb, and two women have gone very early because there was this period of time that Jesus mentioned more than once, three days, three days, three days, and so they have remembered that, and they have gone to the tomb, but I don't think, like, the human mind can't really comprehend what it is Jesus is saying. Like, we're mere mortals, and this God-man has been talking about resurrection, so it just hasn't computed, so when these women women arrive at the tomb, even though in the back of their minds is this notion of three days, they still expect to see somebody lying in the tomb. But the tomb is empty, and they are commissioned to go and tell people what they have seen, specifically to go and tell the disciples. And so they go and are believed, and everybody rushes to the tomb, correct? Incorrect. Nobody can believe them. Nobody can, even though Jesus has said, nobody can believe them. And so we find ourselves post this story. These two walkers are going to Emmaus and they are discussing all of the things that have taken place. Once again, verse 13. Now that same day after this has taken place, after the women have seen the empty tomb and the men dressed in clothes that looked like lightning, they are departing to Emmaus. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Our quick conversions, how many kilometers is that? Good thing I did it, 10 to 12, likely 12 kilometers. Now, this, my average walking pace is like a, a medium to low. Now, I don't really walk fast sometimes if I just wanna get it done, but I'm a bit of a saunterer, so I can do maybe five kilometers in just over an hour. So if I'm walking 12 kilometers, I've got a two and a half hour trek ahead of me. This is ideal conditions, paved road. So I just like to know these details because as we're imagining this walk, the Desire of Ages says that they're fairly early on in their sojourn. So they have a two and a half hour walk ahead of them. Yay! Guaranteed 10,000 steps that day, friends. I promise, guaranteed. So they're on their way, away from Jerusalem, on their way. Verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. What do you imagine the tenor of this conversation is? Is it a joyful one? Is it a sorrowful one? What's happening here? It's sad. It's sad. None of this turned out how they expected it to. 
They had this notion of a reigning king. This is what they pictured. Even though Jesus had never said this is how it was going to go down, they had a picture and their specific expectations were disappointed. And that is hard for us to work through. We can hardly believe it, let alone the fact that he had died such a painful, such a terrible public death. So they were talking with each other. This is Bible speak for friends processing a traumatic event together. They had shared collective trauma. They had shared collective grief and the human heart needed to work through it. So that is what they're doing talking and walking and working through this heartbreak. Verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. His ears must have been burning, so he uses his divine right and just appears beside them. And he classically Jesus, classically Jesus. He appears. Remember, in the Desire of Ages, I said that it's early on, so he has a lot of time that's going to happen. He's got a lot of time that he's setting himself up for with these people. As they talked and discussed, I'm reading this again, these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But, oh, they were prevented from recognizing him. Delicious, right? They are talking about their devastation. They're talking about their grief. They're talking about the unexpected events that have occurred. And where is Jesus? And why Jesus? And what does Jesus do? He starts to walk beside them. But they cannot see who it is. They are prevented of seeing it. How often in our specific situations, are we walking with our heads down, consumed by our own sorrow, consumed by our own worries, and we are blind to the reality that most often Jesus is already there, walking beside us. They cannot see that his presence has already arrived. Do you ever get like that? Let me add this dynamic because the human heart is a, is a confounding thing. Not only do we get blind to the reality that Jesus is already beside us, but for me, let me just speak for myself, I also get blind to the pain and suffering that other people are going through. How could you possibly be suffering as much as I am? Do you know what I have on my plate, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. That reality also makes me blind to the situation of other people. Is that just me? Am I am I talking by myself out here? We get pretty self-focused. And we forget both that Jesus is with us and that we have the opportunity to be like Jesus amidst our pain and suffering during the pain and suffering of other people. So he walks with them. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. I imagine that we can't quite see how gut-wrenching this conversation must have been. They must have been physically looking defeated. They're, the word is broken-hearted. They're looking broken-hearted. That's not a good look, friends. That usually means that showers have been missed and meals have been missed. We wear our sadness visibly sometimes. We can't hide it. And I hate it when people are like, are you okay? I'm fine. I am fine. You look tired. Thank you. I am tired. <laughs> I cannot hide that. This, this reality, this is just humans walking. These sad humans walking, talking about the sad thing that has happened. And Jesus comes up and says, what are you guys talking about? And they are appalled that, they, that he doesn't know what's going on. Listen to their response. He asked them, Jesus himself has arrived on the scene. Jesus himself is asking them what they're talking about. They're talking about him. 
but they cannot believe that he doesn't know. Do you see? They are blind to the fact that Jesus is, and they are shocked at this man's blindness. They can't deal with the fact that, they, that he doesn't know. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days? In other words, are you new here? Do you not know what's going on? Do you not know Jesus? Two things here. The reality of Jesus and what's happening is major. Everybody should know. Everybody should know. But also, the human heart. How do you not know what I'm going through? Right? Like we're shocked when people don't know our suffering, but we don't talk about our suffering. Is that just me again? Is it getting loud in here? They're appalled, like, are you new here? Don't you know that Jesus has died? Often, this too is our prayer. Do you not know how much I'm suffering? Have you forgotten me? Have you left me all alone here? Meanwhile, Jesus, the whole time, is journeying with us. Verse 19, Jesus responds, what things? Sometimes I don't understand Jesus. May I say that? Okay, because why does he ask that question? Shouldn't he just know he lived through it? But he does what he will always do. He will invite us to tell him the story. He will not presume to know everything. He gives us this gracious and compassionate invitation. Implied here is, I have two hours with you, friends. Tell me, tell me what things, what has happened. He gives them an oppor opportunity to frame the story as they understand it. So this is their response. Continuing on in verse 19. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, on this third day, since it is the third day since all of this took place, in addition to this, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. So they're telling him all that's happened. He was supposed to be this, but then he died. And then ever since, these women went to the tomb and he wasn't there. And so ultimately what they're saying is we don't understand. None of this is adding up. We don't understand what's happening. How do you not know what's happening? And can you please explain this to us? There's this like just confusion. And Jesus responds, 25, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. I think the kindly stranger would have had me up until this point. You know what I'm saying, friends? Denisha, you want somebody to be like, you fool, how do you not believe? And how would, I, wouldn't, I, I can imagine how you respond. You, you, you can imagine how I would respond. I <laughs> don't actually do it, don't call me a fool. I, I think that we'll see the unconverted part of my spirit. Which, you know, which I'm constantly at war with any, every day anyways. But if this kindly stranger, after I'm sharing my heartbreak with him, says, you fool, how slow you are to understand and believe. Do you know what's frustrating about that? The most frustrating thing about that is I know. I know. 
I know how stubborn, I know how slow of heart I am, I know I want to believe. And so this is the tension right now. All of the evidence that he is true is there and yet I'm still at war with myself because we are humans, because Jesus will patiently walk through this journey with us. He will not force us to believe. He will invite us to, even if we are stubborn and hard-hearted. He will walk through this with us. And so, instead of revealing himself, it goes on to say, um, verse 25, let me read it again. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and enter his glory? All of a sudden, this person who hasn't known what's going on can tell them, didn't you know that all of this had to take place? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Post-death, the resurrection, only a handful of people have seen him. The easiest thing to do is to be like, hey, it's me, I'm here. Three days, right? He doesn't do that. They are blinded to him. And then what does he do? My guy takes them through a Bible study. Okay. On this side of things, I'm like, if I could see Jesus, I think that would reconcile a lot of the questions that I sometimes have. These guys are walking with Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He's like, have you heard of my friend Moses? Let's begin there. And he systematically takes them through the Old Testament and does what is necessary. He reframes the story so they can't miss it. He goes through the evidence that was there all along and he breaks it down for them. And as only somebody who has walked with them can do, he says, see there in the desert, that was me. See there, that manna you ate, that was me. See there, that water from the rock, that was me. See this tent, I was there the whole time, here and here. Certainly you knew I was coming. And this disappointment that you feel because I'm not the king, there's a greater kingdom that is to come. And I will be there. But he reframes for them through the scripture, What's the lesson there for us, friends? If Jesus, in one of his first appearances, takes the time to work through scripture with these believers, what is our responsibility with scriptures today? Let's sit in them. Let's linger there. Let's look for the face of Jesus. Let it speak to us anew every day. Let it reframe the heartbreak that we feel to see that surely the kingdom is to come. And I get to be a part of this as well. So he walks and he talks and he has a Bible study with them. And suddenly 12 long kilometers has come to the end and we're already here. Now I think Jesus is a very educated, has, has a good sense of like social parameters because this is what he does. They get to the house. Now I'm shameless. Sinvergüenza is the word in Spanish, without shame. So if we get to your house right around supper time, I'm not going to be like, well, off I go. I'm going to just be like, oh, smells nice in there. <laughs> Was that special K-loaf? I thought you could only make that on Sabbath. Hmm, smells delicious. Jesus doesn't do that. He is not shameless. He goes... He makes as if he's going to walk on. Why does he do that? And, and why, does, why is that written in the scripture? Why is that detail there? Tell me why Jesus does not linger at the door, but he makes as if he's going to keep going. Oh, oh, he doesn't force himself. He wants to be invited. It's so simple. Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, 
raised from death to life, King Eternal does not presume to walk through their door unless he is invited. Jesus, Messiah, Son of God, will not force himself, not even in for a meal, unless he is invited. My friends, could it be that he's at the very threshold of the door just waiting for somebody to let him in and say, would you like to have supper with me? It's just a piece of bread. And certainly, this is the invitation. This is how it plays out in the Bible. Um, uh, verse 20, 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. Stay with us. What is more pure what is more heartfelt? What is more human than that simple invitation? Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So what does Jesus do? Does he keep walking because he's got a kingdom to be about? He's got to get back up to his Father in heaven. What does Jesus do with the invitation to stay with us? He stays. He stays. At the invitation, he stays. So he went in. Verse 30, this is when everything is revealed. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And their response is, surely our hearts were burning within us. All along, we knew there was something about that guy. And there had to have been. If you're going to walk two and a half hours with somebody after they've called you a fool, there's got to be something special. And then want to invite him in. Yes! That's Jesus, who will come in an unexpected way exactly as you need him. Perhaps we have painted a very polite Messiah. This Messiah is wild. He died for us, and he longs to come in and meet us, regardless of our mess, any one of us, the myriad of messes that are represented here. This audacious Savior wants to eat with us, break bread and bless us, and reveal himself that he was there all along. What an extravagant gift that this Messiah, so they, they run back to tell. They are so moved by this experience, they break the bread, he disappears, and they're like, we've got to tell people. Do you know what that means? Let's go. 10,000 more steps. Let's go 12, 12, 12 more kilometers back to tell the good news. Because once you open the door and once you break bread with Jesus, somebody else has got to know. We can't, we can't keep this good news. They're not going to sit down and have their bread and be like, that was a really nice walk with Jesus. No way! They're going to go back and tell people that in fact he is alive and he was with them and was with them all along. In the desire of ages, it implies that he accompanies them on the journey back because he appears again to the disciples when they tell them the good news. He's going to walk the 12 there and the 12 back with us. Through whatever situation and circumstance you're dealing with, the Messiah will go with you. But sometimes we need an earthly example of this. Coming back to our beloved Pathfinders who voyaged bravely to Wyoming this summer. Now I think as I I'm not a pathfinder, um, forgiveness. Also, I'm not really gritty, you know? And the Davilas, as a family, we are not so gritty with the camping. You know what I mean? No running water, that impacts us spiritually, I think. <laughs> so, my brother, his son Levi, is of age to be pathfinder. And he's going to Gillette, Wyoming. So do you know what that means for Julio Cesar Davila? 
he is also going. And he also went. Look how cute this is. First of all, they're identical, which is crazy because Levi is a bonus baby in our family. He is our nephew and he is most treasured and he looks exactly like his stepdad. How wild is that? But you go, Julio goes to Gillette, Wyoming without one ounce of Pathfinder in his little soul. Why? Because his son is going. Julio goes to Gillette because his son is going, and that is enough of a reason. In this whole multitude, this is why you go. So Levi can experience the awe and wonder and continue to pin trade and have this wild memory, not just of being in Gillette, but of his dad being there with him. Because in the 60,000 people that were there, for Julio, one mattered above all, and it was Levi. He goes for Levi, and we all send him happily for Levi, because we want eyes on Levi. Those 60,000 souls are precious to me, but there's only one Levi. So Jesus walks along with these disciples because they are precious to him. Even though we only find the name of one and the other one remains a mystery, he still walks beside him. And sometimes to our human adaption of this, the, the human application for this parable is in the walking. We are walked with, but my friends, we have to walk alongside as well. Do you hear me? Because if I need somebody to walk with me, what will be my responsibility as a believer and follower of Jesus? There will be times when I walk for the sake of other people. And in the walking, sometimes you find your tribe. Look at this guy. He's like Nicaraguan flag. I am one of you now. In the walking, we find our people. And in the walking, we do not walk alone. But for Julio, it was one. For God, it would be one, and it would be you. He would do it all again to walk beside you.